Welcome back to another episode of Titans of Now. Titans reaches a wide audience of ServiceNow admins, developers, architects, and product owners. So if you want your brand in front of this audience, check out the description below for how to contact me about sponsorship opportunities. If you want to know what I'm up to lately, I invite you to discover Vivid Charts. Vivid Charts is a visualization and storytelling platform built on ServiceNow. Stop exporting data off platform to get the aesthetic control and storytelling experiences that you want. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Titans of Now. It is so good to have you here. This episode is a very personal one for me as the guest today has been my very close friend and confidant for years. He is a longtime freelance vendor agnostic architect. He is the co-host of CJ and the Duke and the great filter of almost everything I say in the space. If there's anything I've ever said that sounded wise, it's because I first ran it past him. Ladies and gentlemen, Corey CJ Wesley. Corey, welcome to the show. Oh man, Duke, that's like a, that's a, a Steve Harvey-esque intro right there, man. That's <laughs> man, to be compared to Steve Harvey, I don't, like I've, I've almost got the hair for it. <laughs> I've almost got the hair for it. <laughs> I'm working on that, Steve. I'm working on it. And the tan, yeah. and the tan, but, but mostly the hair. <laughs> man, I mean, I just, you know, oh God, I, I got bringing me out to that man i don't know how i can how, how i can possibly live up to that billing but uh, i'll do my best well i mean i know where you got your start in service now because i was there absolutely um, but why, <laughs> nobody else was sucks to be them uh that was a great game that it was a chicago's bull game way back when right yeah man that's back when service now used to you know roll out all the stops man the marketing right. budget was you know was through the roof yeah, uh, Leo, <laughs> Leo Rickman's like, hey, can you come out tonight and talk to one of my potential customers for me? And yeah, sure, Leo, no problem. Yeah. And, you know, it, 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 we had seen each other or I can't remember if that was the first time we met or if that turned out to be the first time and a number of times that we seen each other out at these events before we kind of kindled the friendship. Yeah. But uh, I, I distinctly remember that was the first time we had a really good conversation. I mean, we, we talked practically the entire game. Well, you know yeah. what it was is because we both came from working with Magic Total Service Desk. Yes. Right. Which is absolutely, like, you know, right after Noah was on the mountain chipping away. At the <laughs> yeah, I think that's the, I think you got your biblical icons mixed up a little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> Please do not bring the torch and fix it. When Moses was carving the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets, the next thing he did was write the Magic Total time. Service Desk. Yeah, after That's he handed them to Noah. After he handed it to Noah. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, but seriously, like Magic T Total Service Desk, man, was the bomb. I, mean, I don't know. That, that product was such a, a joy to use and also such a huge frustration at the same time. I don't know. It, it's It actually... It's really weird about that, and, and I know we're talking about service now, so I won't, you know, spend a whole lot of time talking about Magic Total Service Desk. But what I will say is that it is one of the things that really kindled my interest in programming. You know, I'd been in IT at that point for a long time, and I've been doing things like batch scripting my entire IT life, right? Like even before I started doing it professionally. I come from the DOS era, right? Like you could not get games to run without learning how to write a good auto exec dot bat right. <laughs> or, or, or tweak that config dot sys, man. And you had a, a, a boot floppy for every single game you had in your library, right? So, you know, I come from that era. So I'd already had some like, you know, some command line scripting under my belt. But, you know, Magic Total Service Dash, you know, I'll expose the SQL to the platform in such a way that if you actually knew and had a good command of SQL, there was practically nothing you couldn't do inside of that platform. And so I started to learn SQL. I loved Magic at the time, but I still have kind of nightmares about trying to do some of the stuff on Magic that I could do today. <laughs> like yeah. flow and stuff, like you just imagine, you'd have to, oh, don't imagine, it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like some of that stuff, yeah, impossible, yeah. right? The workflow is just forget about it. You just, yeah. you'd be doing it the old, 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 old way, which is a business rule for every stage of the workflow and just- Yes, oh, oh my God, yeah. and having to number them 6.1, 6. Oh, so that yeah. they stayed in order and so you can follow the flow. Oh my God, I forgot all about and that. Did you ever, <laughs> like, do you remember transactional and current data? Like, yes. And then you move into the service now paradigm and it's like, no, current- 
was not the same as the current from the Magic Total Service Desk era. And it's like, ah, I can't get it to fit. I can't get this idea to fit in my head. Anyway, nobody else is going to understand this but us. So we'll just have a good laugh. I know, right? <laughs> but, but two people who understand this, how funny this is. Dude, I mean, it, it's hilarious too, right? Like it is so funny how, you know, how we ended up meeting and connecting over that, right? That's right. And, and, and I, I bet we probably bumped into each other on those good old Yahoo forums as well. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody asked Ron Sorrell the question, and Ron Sorrell answered the question. So absolutely, we at least we'll always have Ron Sorrell. Yes, okay. he's probably still he's probably still doing it too. Okay, cool. Maybe we take this and and take a different path. What was it about Service Now? Like looking back from Magic Total Service Test Days to Service Now, what was your like? Oh hell yeah moment. Dude, I was at my previous employer, the last real employer that I had. Mm -hmm. Great, great place. Absolutely. And BMC has sent us an email saying, hey, this thing's going end of life. And so you know how it is in corporate America, right? Risk management. Once something's going end of life, that it's a wrap. So now we had to kind of rush and figure out. And we still had years. Don't get me wrong. Like this wasn't an end of life overnight. We still mm -hmm. had some years, but it was like, well, you know, support's leaving. We need to figure out what, what our next move is. So testimony to how great this place was right that i worked we all flew out to london and went to a itsm conference and uh king's crossing i think is the name of it uh arrows court out, outside london and uh we tried a, a bunch of itsm platforms right and it, th this is like I, i'll tell you this right i had no freaking idea that there was a such thing as an itsm conference <laughs> <laughs> so so let's get that straight right so this place is imagine that knowledge is vendor agnostic and imagine that there are some a few breakouts but most of the conference is centered around the expo right so that's how this place was set up it was largely expo with a few breakouts you know intermixed in that as well and so uh, our task was to go around and try as much as many of these platforms as we can get as many demos talk to as many marketing folks and figure out like what our next step was going to be. We saw quite a few, but every single body in the group, every single person in the group made it to the service now booth and stopped. <laughs> like it was just, it was mind blowing. So, you know, I, I got over there and I was getting a demo and I, I immediately sent like a text to two other people. You got to come see this. And they sent texts uh, and, and eventually our entire group is standing around the service now guy who's demoing the platform. And this is the back in the good old days. And he's talking right click everything. And I'm like, oh my God, right click. I still to this oh, day, yeah. I'm right click everything, right? Because the Swiss Army knife is service now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, and he's just going, and he's flying through these list views and filtering information and grouping information and showing matching and filter out. And, you know, he's adding the sums and he's doing all kinds of crap. We're just standing there, man, with our, our mouths <laughs> wide open, just a gate like, oh my God, this is wizardry. <laughs> <laughs> And, so, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and, and that was pretty much it. Like the rest of the conference was finding a couple um, stand-ins so that we can justify it to the CIO. Everybody's got a story like that. Isn't that amazing? Like the, all these many years later, and you, you could just sit and listen to anybody's, how did you get on the service now bandwagon? It's just so compelling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, platform's amazing. Yeah. So did you have any points once you deployed it where it was like, oh, wait a second, this is way bigger than IT? Yes. That's a good point. We did have a vendor come in and a shout out to Fruition Partners, you know, rest in peace. And the way that we did that deployment, the way that they actually helped me uh, with that was a, a series of kind of working sessions, right? So just to kind of get me skilled up. I don't know if very many deployments work like this nowadays, but man, was that helpful to me, right? Like, so at the end of that, I felt like I was pretty well skilled up. But one of the other things that, that I came out of that with was a, a, a more thorough understanding of the platform. So as we got it live, I started to look around and think in terms of internal processes, what could we actually use this thing for? Because everything is workflow automation, right? And, you know, I'd already been thinking about things in this manner from the magic standpoint, right? I mean, it wasn't quite good enough to do most of the things the service now could do, but, you know, I'd already, already had that kind of like workflow automation mindset from, from those days. And yeah, that was an internal process that was basically an email box and one person was managing it. And this particular person would go on vacation and then nobody would manage this process and hundreds of emails would just kind of get dumped in this box and this person would have to sort through them when they got back. And, you know, looked at that part, at that and said, well, you know, we can actually get all those emails in the service now. We can create tickets, right? And, uh, and then people can jump in and, and manage that. Not even just when they're, that person's on vacation, but also while they're there, 
right? So you can have backups who are actively managing it with you. Think about that. So that was a, you know, a, a line of business um, process, you know, so that was probably the first non-IT process that I automated. And it came maybe a couple months after Go Live. Those are pretty inspiring times. And I know we still have, I think you can still walk into any organization, look at their mail processes and just right. pull millions of dollars of value out. You can still do that. But there was a time, there was a time <laughs> when you could go into organizations and you could show them service now. People yes. who are outside of IT and they would look at forms and lists for managing work and they'd literally say, what in the hell is that? Yes. You know, <laughs> forms and lists. And they'd be like, what's all these records and shit? Like, look, I can actually track my work. <laughs> this is My computer mom. stuff guys this is computer stuff <laughs> Dude, right like yeah. i mean it, it was it was a whole nother paradigm right uh -huh. like it, it would take a couple of meetings right like just to get through the shock value of what the platform can do and the fact that this it wizardry could descend upon the business and yeah, man. I mean, yeah like now it's kind of like, like it's just one of those things it's like no entity like people just expect this out of the platform and expect, mm -hmm. you know, other folks in the business to just get on board. But man, back in the day, like that was eight, some nine just, years ago, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's still inspiring. And to some extent, people should have those good expectations now. And I'm glad they do. But man, it was just so mm, something about it. It was magic, dude. I mean, yeah, it, it literally was. Magic. I mean, yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. After well, magic had run its course, the real magic started. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You probably already answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What yeah. parts of the platform do you most resonate with? And it could even be abstract if you want to talk to just like general architecture. You could say that too. Yeah. The things that I like about the platform are the platform itself. That's probably number one. And, and the reason I say that is the platform itself gives you such a great jumping off point to do practically anything else you ever want to do. You don't have to build anything with this thing, right? Like, I mean, if you're built, think about it. If you're like somebody who's thinking of, uh, of, of doing a startup, right? And and you got to build like some code, right? To to build this product. And it's whoever, it might be business faces, consumer faces. No, it doesn't matter, right? The fact is you got to build something and sell it to people, right? You got to build communication, so emails or push notifications or what have you. You got to build a mobile app possibly, or even if maybe we can say, you know, you'll do that in phase two. You still got to build a website, right? You got to build workflow automation because things happen, right? And th there's a start and an end to every process and everything's a process. So you got to build that out, right? You got to build things like event management or, or the, yeah, event management ability to kind of keep tabs on what's going on in the on and on and on, right? Reporting, dashboards, the whole nine yards, right? You got to build all of that stuff. ServiceNow gives you all that for free, right? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, it's that. just, you know, just, just turn the key, right? Boom, all of a sudden, I don't have to build anything boring. <laughs> just like that. And it's so like, it's, like year after year, I keep on, like when, as I hear people describe it and that word platform just keeps on getting more and more nuance and meaning and flavor, man. Yes. <laughs> platform. Yes. Like it allows me to stand above all the rest. Yeah, right? Like, I mean, that's exactly what it is. It allows you to stand above the rest when you start. And then everything mm -hmm. you're building on top of that, right? You already got that head start. My most favorite part of the, of the platform is the platform itself. But then next, I'd say things like integrations are probably the next thing because now you got this great platform. What do you want to do with it? Well, there's a lot of things out there with an API that'd be really cool if you could take that data and that system and bring it over here and then do things on the platform with it. I think one, at, one, at one knowledge service now says something like uh, there. I think the theme was something like the, the platform of platforms or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. and, they, yeah. and they focus really heavily on the ability to integrate with practically everything else in your enterprise. And that really stuck with me because it's just so cool to be able to do that, to, to pull in data from from every other corner of your of your enterprise and then get it in the platform, turn it into an app, you know, run some workflow against it and some, you know, get some metrics and some reporting and some dashboards. And all of a sudden, man, we got a stew cooking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it allows you to slay higher level dragons too. I think if I just go way back to my D&D &D days for a bit, but yeah. it, it, there's only so many problems you can solve or such a scale of problem that you can solve when you're thinking about what can I do with this tool and this tool only. Yes. Right? Yes. But if you have a hammer and a drill 
<laughs> you, like you can build way better stuff. You can solve way bigger problems. If you only have a hammer, you can yeah. only pound in nails. But Absolutely. you think about like, you just allows you to think of like, you could do a whole systems thinking, right? Forget about the actual component tools. Think about how does this whole problem start, finish and end. And, and sometimes the best solution is to make a mosaic of three or four applications that all are exquisite at doing their own thing. Yes, absolutely. You said something, you said a key phrase there, systems thinking. Uh, it's, it's something I've been, you know, d- diving into a lot lately, just because it's one of those quantified self things, right? I'm always trying to understand like how I work and how I operate, how I think, right? And, you know, I've come to the, to the conclusion that I'm natively built to be a systems thinker. And I, I feel the same way about you too, Duke. And I feel like people who, who really do well in the service now space are systems thinkers. And that's kind of a, a segue and a side, whatever you want to call it. Cause you know, but it, it's just one of those things you said that gave me, you know, just some thoughts around the mindset about what it takes to be really good at utilizing the platform to get things done. Tell us about some other things you think it takes to be really good at the platform and getting things done. Man, soft skills. Like, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> we still got to do the CJ and the Duke episode on that. <laughs> we, we absolutely do. But let me tell you, man. This will be the brainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, it's easy to say tech skills, right? And tech skills are required, right? Depending on, you know, where you are. I mean, look, they, they're required regardless. You want to be able to write you know, some level of code. But I'll be honest, right? And this is, this is a secret just between me and you and the audience. You don't have to be the world's best developer. <laughs> Ask me how I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be real, right? Like you want your code to be bug free. You want it to be reasonably well written to the point where like future you is not going to you know, kick your ass when you go hunting around and trying to scale it later. But at the same time, your clients are not hiring you for the most part to write code. They're hiring you to solve problems. Right. And solving problems requires an extended skill set beyond just writing code. Right. Solving problems uh, involves getting people in a room together and, and being able to talk and work through the problem itself with the people taking into mm. account all the people things. Right. Like personalities and hierarchies and things like who stands to benefit if this project wins and loses. Right. Like th- taking things like that into account and knowing how to push something forward for the mutual benefit of everyone in the room, right? Yeah. Like maybe it's emotional intelligence or whatever you want to call it, right? But just having that ability to work the people angle of these things is really beneficial. Yeah, I think like everybody who aspires to be a great ServiceNow architect should listen to Kenny Rogers, the gambling man, at least once. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and just slowly one meditate on songs. what he's talking about, you know? <laughs> but Absolutely. It, it really is kind of one of those universal, you just got to know when to roll them and know when to fold them. And it doesn't come from anything else other than practice and familiarity with other human beings. Yeah, man, absolutely. And I'm a poker player too, by the way. And so that song resonates with me for a number of different reasons, right? But also in this space, because you do have to know when to back off and you need to know when you need to push. Let's be real. One of the one of the real key skills that I have, right, is telling people no, but making them think it's their, their idea. You know, and- Inception, <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, your client is always right, right? Until you- but so make them think that they're right when, when they are saying no to themselves. And, I mean, that's, that's just one of the things. And so that there's other stuff too, like keeping your eye on the ball, right? Like it's always the focus about what you're there to deliver, mm-hmm. right? For me, I'm always there to deliver value and value comes in a number of different ways. It doesn't even just exist on the platform. And it's not just what you take out of the platform. It's everything that I have, all of the experience that I've gained in my numerous careers and and years and years of experience doing everything I have, all of that I bring to every engagement that I have. So sometimes it might be a little nugget of business skill that I picked up in a job previously that comes into play in a conference room that helps the client move from point A to point C, right? And that might have nothing at all to do with ServiceNow, but all of that stuff comes to bear about being a good architect and being good with the platform and being good for your clients and getting to the finish line and being successful with that. You know what sucks? What's that? Is that the church organ didn't come in time for me. (laughs) (laughs) When the choir rose, testify. (laughs) Buddy, like... But I mean, but 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 I'm right. You know what I mean? You are right, yeah. And it's it's just one of those things, it's kind of like, 
I might not work in sales, but I know for a fact that everything I know about sales makes everything else I do that much better. It, even about right. like, physical fitness, it doesn't matter what you do in life. If you're physically fit, it's much way better. easier. You know what yep. I mean? And, and so the soft skills that people management expertise, it doesn't matter where you are right now. More of that will always make whatever you're doing that much better. Absolutely. And, and not only that, well, it'll break down some of those barriers that you have sometimes. But sometimes you're going to get in a situation where you got to people your way out of a, one situation in order to use the technology skill on the other situation, right? So yeah, you just yeah. got to be aware of that stuff, man. There's different roles in the ServiceNow ecosystem, right? To me, architect is not one of those roles that is purely technical, Right. It is a role that takes into the has to take into account the people aspects of it, the systems thinking, the ability, like I said, that emotional intelligence, the ability to focus on a value, the ability to drive a project to its, its successful conclusion and not just write code. And mm -hmm. I'm not knocking writing code. I write a lot of code. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I actually it's my happy place. I put on my headphones, put some music on. Right. And I, and I write code for hours and it calms me down. But it's not it, it's not the only thing that I do. And it's, I don't even know at this point if it's the most valuable thing that I do, mm -hmm. depending on the engagement. I mean, yeah. sometimes it's being in that uh, workshop with their client and, and working through their problems and getting that process that they have in their head refined to the point of where it's actually going to work well on the platform and be scalable, successful and sustainable. Testify, testify, brother. <laughs> wow. We haven't asked nary a one question. <laughs> 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 All right. Here's one from the standard list. Tell us about a time where you didn't think you were going to make it. Oh, man. Okay. That's a good question. So I'll tell you about a time I actually did not make it because I don't think there's ever a time I've thought that I wouldn't make it. But this time I thought I would make it and I didn't. Mm -hmm. So I had a client several years ago at this point, and they had a previous architect who had built a system for them. And it was a good system that worked really well for their needs. It was rather complicated to maintain. And they expected me to come in and to basically be that guy, to be the person who had previously built this, this complicated system and extend it and you know, understand it and all sorts of things, right? And they expected me to hit the ground running. Well, you know, I, I dove into what they had built and man, this thing was I mean, this is back in the days of hardcore customization, right? Where it was wasn't it wasn't an unknown thing to jump to land into a situation where somebody had really got into the system, you know what I mean? And really yeah, yeah. and turned the wrench a bit. And I'm in there and I'm I'm trying to get this thing working, but it, it is, man. It, it's got dependencies all over the place. It's calling from here and there and everywhere. And I'd finally gotten a, a good MVP going, right? And I, and all the while that I'm doing this, right, I'm having I'm touching base with this client. And the only thing that I keep coming away with after every conversation is I'm not that guy. Right. Like I'm <laughs> and and so everything that I'm doing for this team is OK, but it's not how he would have did it. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like, OK, well, I need you. You want X, Y and Z like, you know, we need a little bit more time to get there and blah, blah, blah. And we extended the project a little bit all the while. And I didn't even bring this part all the while. I got this crappy PM. Right. And no offense to PMs out there. I love PMs, especially the good ones. I don't like the bad ones. This was a bad one. <laughs> I don't think this person was actually doing much work. I, I felt like, I, I mean, this person canceled most of, their, most of the meetings that they were supposed to run or they didn't show up, leaving me to run the meetings. So they didn't like liaise with the client in an appropriate way. And when they did, they would come in and tell the client, yes, absolutely. You're right. I will chastise the, the architect. And, uh -huh. and so that happened a bunch of times. And I felt like it was a really adversarial relationship, not, not only just between me and the client, but also me and my PM, who's supposed to have been on my side. <laughs> right. and, and, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, I got them, you know, a product that worked. It wasn't my best work, in my opinion. Right. Like, so I, I consider that a, fa a failure, but it did work at the end of the day. But it was they were not happy with it, even though it did. And so that was one of the, that was one situation where, you know, if I could take that back, I'd probably not take the project, number one, um, you know, knowing what I know now. But number two, I'd also recommend a, just a complete re-architecture. This was really early in my freelance career. I probably didn't have the confidence that I needed in certain cases to talk to the client and say, hey, we're going about this the wrong way. Let's build this in a better way. You know, I didn't have that confidence to have that conversation with the client. I was only really trying to give them what they asked for and not what they needed. 
And that mm. was on, that's that's a, a thing on me, right? Because as the architect, I'm supposed to know what they actually need, and I'm supposed to, you know, I don't say force the issue, right? But really make it apparent to the client when you're going when they're going down the wrong road. And I, I didn't do that well enough there. And so, you know, I, I definitely consider that a failure. I've learned from that now, though. I I, I don't give advice or I don't say yes um, in situations where I really should say no. You know, I I might I'll say yes, but <laughs> quite often. So yeah. Yeah. And actually, before anybody starts to think in like, oh, wait, the customer's always right. And how like, (laughs) (laughs) well, I always say, I always say the customer's intent is always right. Their intent is always right. All right. The specifics of their, of their, like they might uh, break out the Amish metaphor again. Right. But if I'm asking an Amish person, how do I get from New York to Alabama? Yeah, you know they're going to be talking about the t- the size of wagon you need to haul the goods that you're going to eat along the way, and where you can change your horses, and you'll be like, "What? Like we're just going to drive the airport? We'll be down there in four hours." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but their need is pure. Like we need to get from New York to Alabama. That's right. Yep. The fact that they think the fastest way is via horseback, okay, that's not so right. And you don't even have to tell them you're wrong. I'm right. You could be like, you have a conflict of interest with yourself. Yes. Like you want to do it the right way, but you also want to ride a horse for some reason. Tell me why you want to ride a horse. <laughs> you know? and, and then it's just, it's not you versus them. It's them versus them. And you get to guide them and they get to be the hero and pick the right thing. So there's care, power in key. being able to say like, <laughs> it's not even saying no, it's, it's kind of like getting them to the right manifestation of Yes. Absolutely. I can't I said manifestation. <laughs> hey man, you got <laughs> you got to manifest that shit, dude. <laughs> All right. So I want to give you a, an opportunity to kind of showcase what you offer to the world. A lot of this we're talking about in the context of Tech Voyant, right? Yeah. So why don't you tell everybody who, who hasn't heard of Tech Voyant what Tech Voyant is and does? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So at Tech Volume, what we do is we really focus on IT process and business process automation, right? Like, so utilizing the ServiceNow platform, you know, that's really the focus of what I like to bring to the table. And, you know, I, I'm a big automation buff. I, I automate everything that I can in my, you know, my home life. And, you know, I really like to focus on that too, when I'm looking at processes that clients bring to me in terms of how can we make this the least manual how can we make this the least intensive process possible when it comes to manual intervention, right? Like how can we go from point A to point Z with the least amount of human uh, beings touching this thing? And so, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I said on a previous podcast, what I like to do is take a process, break it all apart, and then put it back together with the least amount of Lego blocks possible, right? <laughs> That's a lot of what my focus is on any engagement is like, let's bring this to the table. Let's do this as simply as possible, but also delivering tremendous amounts of value to my customers. Right. And nothing overrules, right. Nothing comes before the value that I want to actually deliver, deliver to my customers. Right. That's always first and foremost in, in my mind is making sure that for every unit of money that they pay me, that I deliver back to them multiple units of value. Right. And, and at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's really what Tech Voyant is all about, right? Delivering more value to my customers than they pay me for. Uh, I guess the next follow-up question to that is, what are you most proud of in your ServiceNow journey? All right. Going freelance probably is one of the things that I'm most part of in my life, period. And, and probably, and so I'd say that's definitely one of the things that I'm most proud of in my ServiceNow journey is taking that leap of leaving the shelter of Bitco and going out there on my own and really, you know, you eat what you kill, right? To a certain extent and making, yeah, making that transition. I've been really successful with it. I've been independent for about six years now and I love it. I've done really well with it and I don't regret the decision at all. And I was really scared about it, to be quite honest, because I left the gig that I loved. Let me tell you, like this was all time top job I've ever had in my life. Right. And when I left there, I left the promotion on the table. And so it was uh, a scenario where I was betting hugely on myself. And the downside of that was all of the missed opportunity that I was leaving on the table by leaving Bitco. And, you know, I, I like to say it worked out pretty well for me, but I, I didn't know at the time. You know, it was, a, it was a big gamble. Well, the ecosystem's a ton better for it, too. Oh, I appreciate yeah. that. All right. If you could change anything about the product or the ecosystem, what do you think mm-hmm. you'd change? 
Oh, man. That's I think we did question. a whole episode on this once. All right. uh, so, the service freaking catalog, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Look, let's get rid of variables. I freaking hate variables. Get rid of variables. Let's make this, let's bring the service catalog out of the cold, right? Let's bring it onto the platform as a full stakeholder and let's make it work. And look, we, we're getting there. Don't get me wrong. We're, we're getting they're, they're, They've made some modifications and such. And it's kind of getting, there. but look, nothing, nothing works as well as a table with fields in it. <laughs> and, yes. you know, I, I mean, that's first party, right? I feel like the service catalog is third party development. Right. And, and not like the good third party developers like Rare, who built like GoldenEye either or, or, or you know, like Hudson Soft back in the day. Like I'm, I'm taking you old school here. Right. Like with Bomberman and things like that. I'm talking about like some of the third party developers who want to get one shot, get one game. It tanks and they're gone. Right. Like to me, that's the service catalog It's out there on the on the limb by itself, just hanging out when it needs to come onto the platform and be a lot more native in terms of how the rest of the platform works, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I I would re-architect that thing so so hard, man. And I don't necessarily know what the right answers there are, but I I think it's got to be it's got to feel a lot more um a lot more like the incident table or the problem table or change or any of the task tables or any of the other tables and service now do and and, and how, how they are natively. Like just having this whole kind of weird variable variable set container ish setup, you know? Oh it just, yeah, it, the, the form. Oh. Yeah, man. Like it. You know how long it takes to make a freaking semi-complex catalog item. Like, come on, yeah. man. <laughs> it is really. I mean, you could you can make the case that you can build a citizen developer app. You know what I mean? Or yeah. not even a citizen developer app, but like, like a local developer could build a app based on tables. Yes. Faster than you can build a decent sized catalog item sometimes. Absolutely. And they can do, and look, let me tell you, right? Because you can then go into the form designer or, or form layout, right? Even the form layout, old school form layout, right? It's still quicker to move these things around on the canvas than freaking dealing yeah. with order numbers well, on the f- variables. I'll tell you <laughs> what, dude, too. The, like, think about the, the things that the new UI builders, they've gone through a few of them in the, in the last few years, but everything they're trying to do is trying to make building more complex interfaces easier, but they still attach, when it comes to catalog items, it's still like two columns of fields. And it's not even the same type of fields that you can add on other tables. Right. Right? And it's so, it's and then multiple variable sets, which kind of don't, but like, <laughs> we have to imagine what at scale, like we just gave service catalog to the entire world, the kind of stuff that they would want to do on it. Like I want to order a pizza. Well, I need a map. Right. right? Or, or I want to send something from here to there. And it's like, these things don't have to be, I, I want to just pick up a microphone and just say what I want. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm in the engine room of this ship and it's full of smoke and that machine over there is on fire and I can read its serial number. And I just want to say that into a microphone and just have it like, run the emergency ship maintenance program or something. Yes. Like it had its shot. It's come this way. It's put the whole team up on its back and it's run, but now it's 80 years old. Get it off the field. And (laughs) (laughs) yes, you know what I mean? And, and like, let's do the, do it justice to what it has done for us and transcend Absolutely. It's trying to draft man, a replacement. Get in trouble for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, but it's true, right? It's time to draft a replacement, man. And, yeah. You know, we, we it's, it's been great. It's got us here. And look, I get it, right? Like, you know, variables, the ability to create those from scratch, right? Like on a, in a on a blank canvas allows you to make basically make a service request out of anything without having to sprawl in your database of all of these different tables and columns. I, I get that, but it sucks. From a use it from a usability standpoint of the person building it, if it is anything more complex than about ten variables, forget about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't want to do it. I don't. You know, so I don't know, man. Yeah, that's me. Or, or at least give me a better way to freaking align them on the canvas. I'll take that. Yeah, that'd be a good start. <laughs> that would be a good start, right? Like, so I don't have to monkey around with like, I got to leave enough space in my numbering scheme just in case I need to move something from the end to the middle so that it goes from the left side of the oh, field, yeah. of the form to the right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Youngins be like, why do you express your order in thousands? I'll be like, you'll see. You'll, you'll see. see. <laughs> <laughs> Man. All right. And speaking
Speaking of the youngins, if you had any advice for people who are maybe not even just starting off, but people who are earlier along in their service now career, what kind of advice would you give? Right. Click everything. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing that I would say is that know that your skill set with service now is not the entirety of who you are. Right. Bring everything that, that you are to whatever engagement that you're on. Because some of that other experience that you have, even life experience, is, is relevant and can't be pertinent to the client. So you don't stop at just the technical aspects. Bring bring more. More evidence that we are actually brothers somehow. Because <laughs> <laughs> I told somebody that yesterday. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. All right, Love it. All right. All right, Corey, we are at time. It was such a pleasure having you on the show. I'm so glad we got you on. Thanks again for... Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, Duke. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Later. If you'd like to sponsor this channel's content, email me at the address pictured here. If you need a conversation on where your ServiceNow implementation is or where it's going, you can reach me on SuperPeers and book a short consult. If you want to contribute to high quality, high frequency output, consider a donation. If not, I still appreciate your viewership. Consider hitting the like button and sharing within your network. Thanks for watching.